This one is called Conflict to Communion because we are dealing with the unification process that is taking place in the world today. And in the last two lectures, we looked at the great doctrines of justification by faith alone, according to Protestantism, and the doctrine of the atonement. And we saw that the various parties see these doctrines in an entirely different light. And these were the issues that fueled the Reformation. And we can see today that uh, they claim to have resolved them, but the wording and the semantics are such that there is absolutely no resolution as far as one can see. Look at that marvelous printing press standing over there in this corner. This is the actual replica, working replica, by the way, of the Gutenberg Press. And this is what made it possible to disseminate and spread the message of the Reformation like no previous era had been able to do. And uh, I was privileged to be in the museum where they have this thing standing and actually printed a page myself of a, one page of the Bible. That was rather magnificent. I have it framed at home and I'm very pleased to have it. But this one really works and it is a historic part of the Reformation. Let us get into this story. Not only is Protestantism and Catholicism supposed to come together and bury the hatchet of conflict, but the Pope would want all the world religions to join hands. So the Pope called for all the religions to unite, and he did that in March 2013. And very shortly thereafter, on the 17th to the 18th of September in 2014, the World Alliance of Religions and Peace Summit was held in Seoul in the Republic of the Korea, hosted by Heavenly Culture World Peace Restoration of Light. And this summit was attended by many dignitaries. There were 50 political leaders, including former and current heads of states, prime ministers, ministers from 30 countries, 680 religious leaders, and over 2,000 people signed the peace agreement where they said that we all serve the same God, the God that we find in the, in the wind and in the rain and in the trees. And I found it rather fascinating when this signing ceremony took place that all the major religions were well, they were present. Uh, the Christian religions were represented by the Catholics and by the Anglicans. The Evangelicals were not there directly represented, probably via the Anglicans, but uh, they signed the Unity of Religion Agreement and agreed that peace between all the religions would bring an end to war, and at the same time the politicians downstairs signed the declaration to end all war on this planet. And they said there should be peace. And they held a huge celebration in the stadium where they said, we are one. Now, it is good when people talk to each other. It is good when they bury hatchets as far as violence and all of these issues is concerned. But there is one little verse which is so problematic in the Bible, and that is 1 John 2, 23. Whosoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So religious tolerance and religious liberty means that everybody should have the right to worship according to their conscience as they see fit. But that does not mean that you have to join hands and claim that we are all worshipping the same deity. 
After all, how can a deity that has a son be the same deity as a deity that has no son? Isn't that slightly problematic? Just a question. But it goes a little bit further. Pope Francis says, religions should not be confined to personal conscience. That's rather fascinating. The orderly development of a civil pluralistic society requires that the authentic spirit of religion, this is directly from Vatican Radio, so this is not hearsay, not be confined to personal conscience, but that that significant role in the construction of society is recognized, said Pope Francis in his remarks to the Italian president. Although independent church and state share common responsibility of meeting people's spiritual and physical needs with humility and dedication. So it shouldn't be up to me and to my conscience, according to the Vatican, to decide whom or what I should believe. That's rather fascinating. Not only is that a problem, but here's another interesting development. Pope condemns religious fundamentalism and Middle East violence. Any form of violence is to be condemned. That I can understand. But he has some interesting statements. He says a fundamentalist group, even if it kills no one, even if it strikes no one, is violent. The mental structure of fundamentalism is violence in the name of God. So how can a meek and mild fundamentalist group be violent? Well, surely this violence refers to the spiritual clash. And uh, he goes even further than that. He claims, Pope Francis declares, that Christian fundamentalism is a sickness. Hmm. And the question is here asked by these people, is a belief in the strict literal interpretation of the Bible a sickness? Because that is exactly what the definition of fundamentalist is. I mean, the modern view is a fundamentalist is someone who uh, will harm other people, blow himself up, or blow other people up together with himself. And there's no doubt that if you want to force people to dance according to the dictates of your conscience, then that is violence. But to hold a view and to share a view, that should be your religious right. Because people have a freedom of choice. How can you make a choice if there is no information? Surely when you go to vote in a political setup, there is a lot of information that is put out by the various parties. Isn't that the case? And then you weigh the evidence and you make a choice based on information. But if a, your freedom of conscience is to be curtailed, as the papacy claims, then it seems to me that we are moving back towards the situation in the Middle Ages. So let's have a look at the dictionary definition. Let's take a very modern dictionary, dictionary.com, and ask what is the meaning of fundamentalist? And here they claim it is a movement in American Protestantism that arose in the early part of the 20th century. I'm not sure whether that is true, but nevertheless, in reaction to modernism, and that stresses the infallibility of the Bible, not only in matters of faith and morals, but also in the literal historical record holding as essential to Christian faith belief in such doctrines as the creation, the virgin birth, the physical resurrection, the atonement by the sacrificial death of Christ, and the second coming. Hmm. So that's a fundamentalist. I'm uh, exposed. <laughs> they caught me red-handed. <laughs> I'm sorry to admit that if that is the definition, well, then I am a fundamentalist. The belief held by those in this movement is also fundamentalism and strict adherence to any set of basic ideas or principles, the fundamentalism of the extreme conservatives. 
Now, you know, when you, when you use words like that, you think of these bigoted people with the, you know, the straight faces and the straight-laced behavior and all of those things. I certainly hope that if you believe these things, you don't necessarily become a bigot. You just believe what the Bible says. Is there anything so wrong with believing what the Bible says? Well, Rome seems to think so. This is uh, Colonel T.H. Hummus, and he was speaking at the Center for Asymmetric Warfare at Georgetown University, which is the Jesuit University in North America, the Jesuit University. And uh, let's hear what he has to say about fundamentalism, and he's going to mention three groups. He's going to mention fundamentalists that come from Muslim, Christian, or Marine. That means whether they are Muslims, whether they are Christians, or whether they serve in the military, what should happen to them? What, what should one do? How should one deal with these fundamentalists? And he gives a little definition too. It's very short, so listen carefully. External actors have to be eliminated. These guys who are coming in are the most dangerous of all because they're true believers. And true believers, whether they're Muslim, they're Christian, or they're Marine, are dangerous people because there is no other way other than their way. And you've got to either, you've got to eliminate them. You've got to go. So if you're a true believer, whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Christian, or whether you serve in the military, you've got to be eliminated because you're dangerous, because you believe that this is the truth. Now, isn't that what the Reformation believed? Didn't they say sola scriptura? Didn't they say the Bible is the standard and the norm? Well, then uh, they would have to be eliminated, according to this illustrious gentleman. Pope Francis calls for unity between evangelicals and Catholics, and he says that the vision is the work of the devil. It is the work of the father of lies. Uh, it's got to go. Now, how do you do that? Well, this is the way to go about it. Fox News reports that Pope urges Lutherans to set aside doctrine to work together. Let's get rid of it. I mean, doctrine is such a problematic little word. And then the Pope and the president of the Lutheran World Federation signed this joint statement. And they signed the joint statement on Monday in which Catholics and Lutherans pledged to pursue their dialogue in order to remove the remaining obstacles that hinder them from reaching full unity. So they need a common witness on behalf of the poor, the needy, and the victims of injustice. Now, if you read that carefully, it sounds so good. It sounds so humanitarian. Is there anything wrong with taking care of the poor and the needy and, and any of those things? Absolutely not. That is a Christian commitment that you will be kind to those who are less fortunate than yourself. And uh, the question is, is that the gospel? Or is that a consequence of having heard the gospel? Because the gospel is the good news of salvation. And salvation is the issue surrounding the gospel. So that when I bring the good news, I should bring the gospel. Which gospel? The gospel of the atonement, as in the Bible, by the blood of the Lamb. The gospel of justification by faith in alone in the completed work of a Savior, or the opposite gospel of atonement, not by the blood, but by the good works of either Jesus or Mary or any of the saints. So those are two diametrically opposed gospels. So let's can them and let's concentrate on the problems of humanity. That's all very nice, but it's not preaching the gospel. What is the purpose of the church? Isn't the church an, supposed to be an ambassador for God? 
And if you are an ambassador of God, you represent the government of God, and that is your duty. The rest is a consequence. In a message told Mary, uh, this is the, the book Queen of All, it's about the visions of Mary, and uh, where people had visions of her. Tell the priest, tell everyone, that it is you who are divided on earth, the Muslim, the Orthodox, for the same reason as Catholics are equal before my son and I, you are all my children. She wants unity. So there is a massive drive towards an ecumenical movement towards Rome. The Queen proclaims that there will come a time when all of Christendom will be reunified under the Roman Church. All right, if you believe in apparitions that make such claims, well, then you are very confident to move forward. And if uh, this comes from Mary and Protestants didn't actually believe in, in these manifestations, then this is quite in your face. And Pope Pius IX made this remarkable prediction in 1878 concerning Mary's role to establish the world under her church, the Roman Catholic Church. We expect that the Immaculate Virgin and Mother of God, Mary, through her most powerful intercession, will bring it about that our Holy Mother, the Catholic Church, will gain in influence from day to day amongst all nations, in all places, prosper and rule from ocean to ocean, from the great stream to the ends of the earth, and she will enjoy peace and liberty, and there will then be one fold and one shepherd. Well, are we moving in that direction? 2017, we are now well into 2017, and if we blink, it will be gone. Pope, at charismatic rally in stadium, invites them to the Vatican in 2017. Why? Because 2017 is a very special jubilee year. Now, Rome loves to work things in jubilee cycles. And so, even the release of the suffering in purgatory works in jubilee cycles. So, what happened? Pentecost is celebration of unity in diversity, says the Pope. So this year, they were present to celebrate their 50th year of existence, and he used it to say that there should be unity in diversity. This happens, he said, in his homily at the Mass, the Pope said, Christians can block the unity and diversity desired by the Holy Spirit by focusing on their differences rather than on what they share. This happens when we want to separate, when we take sides and form parties, when we adopt rigid and airtight positions, when we become locked into our own ideas and ways of doing things, perhaps even thinking that we are better than others. When this happens, the Pope said, we choose the part over the whole. Belonging to this or that group before belonging to the church and taking pride in being Christians of the right or the left before being on the side of Jesus. Nice words. But uh, are they true words? If we happen to understand and believe the word of God, does this make us better people than other people? It doesn't make you better. It just makes you different. You actually believe what it says. Finally, the Pope invites the crowd, which included charismatics from 55 countries, to come to St. Peter Square, Pentecost 2017. It just took place, and he used it for the unity um, celebration. And then we have another jubilee in 2017. This is the 100th anniversary of the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima. So this is a double jubilee. So 2017 is a very powerful year. 
And that celebration took place now in May, and Pope Francis was greeted by crowds of hundreds of thousands, they say more than a half a million people, congregated around the papacy. They even closed the borders, some of them, and had very stringent uh, regulations, and here's part of the crowd. And he took the opportunity to declare the children that had seen the apparition to be saints. So he beatified them. We declare the blissful Francisco Marto and Jacinta Marto saints. The pontiff said to loud applause, it is 100 years since the two and the third child reported seeing the Virgin Mary while tending sheep. The third is also on the way to sainthood. He also took the opportunity to pray before the graves of the two. And this has always been a problem with, with Protestantism. The veneration of the dead, which basically is necromancy, which is actually forbidden by the Bible. It's also interesting that the people were crawling on their knees towards the shrine. Tell the priest, said Mary in another vision, everyone that it is you who are divided on earth. Mary, she has a message of peace. You are all my children. This is what we looked at. This is the message that is being brought forward, that she has this role to establish the church under the leadership of Rome. And then there was another interesting jubilee in this year, and that concerns the prophecy of Rabbi Judah ben Samuel. And it's a prophecy that made in 1217, but it's, it's, well, there's a lot of controversy around it as to whether it was fixed after the fact or whether it was manipulated in some way or the other, and uh, whether it was going to take place or whether it wasn't going to take place, but it's interesting. He also predicted jubilee cycles, which from 1217, would have a jubilee cycle spreading over 300 years to 1517 when the Turks took control of Jerusalem. Then another 400 year cycle, eight jubilees where the Turks ruled. Then the Turks would lose it. Then there would be no man's land. Then another jubilee, 1967, the Six Day War. And at the end of that jubilee, which just ended now in this year, that would be the day of the Lord and the Messiah would return to this earth. Well, the celebration has taken place. And I find it interesting that the 50th anniversary of Jerusalem reunification was celebrated at the Capitol in the United States and at the Knesset, and that they joined Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, for a simultaneous celebration of the 50th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem. So it seems everybody's very excited about all this unity that is going on in the world. The religions have signed the unity of, of religions agreement. The jubilees have taken place. The apparitions have been used to you know, put their stamp of an approval on this unification. But of course the great event is the jubilee of the Reformation. 2017 is the 500th year of the Reformation, and this is the poster from the Lutheran World Federation. In 2008, this is an interesting interview with a journalist. There was an interview with Emil Hakenis, the Jesuit professor, and the, Ed, and the Jesuit professor Edward Kimmen, who was then General Secretary of the Netherlands Bishop Conference, and he said, there remains hardly any reason to remain a Protestant. In fact, he saw Protestantism as an action group that forgot to dissolve itself. Hmm. And that it had not recognized the significance of a global visible leadership personality such as the Pope. And then he made an interesting statement. He stated that he doubted that the Reformation would still exist after 2017. Well, that's what the Jesuits 
seem to have been working towards the Protestants should return to the Mother Church. Religious News Services reports that the two sides decided to bury the hatchet for the upcoming commemoration of the commencement of the Protestant movement, and they brought out a document called From Conflict to Communion, therefore the title of this lecture. In the document, the two churches recognized that in an age of ecumenism and globalization, the celebration requires a new approach focusing on reciprocal admission of guilt and on highlighting the progress made by Lutheran Catholic dialogue in the past 50 years. Isn't it interesting that the dialogue between the two has also been for an exact jubilee period? And then this statement. The fact that the struggle for this truth in the 16th century led to the loss of unity in Western Christendom belongs to the dark pages of church history. Uh, I always thought that uh, that period was called the Dark Ages and that it was ended by this occurrence. But nevertheless, in 2017, we must confess openly that we have been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. So this is the official document from conflict to communion and it's between the Lutheran World Federation and the Pontifical Council for promoting Christian unity and uh, it invites all Christians to study its report open-mindedly and critically. So I took that injunction very seriously and decided to do just that. And I thought I would share with you what I found because this is a very important step that is being taken here. The fact that the struggle for this truth in the 16th century led to the loss of unity, as we have seen, belongs to the dark age pages of church history. Two challenges, the purification and healing of memories and the restoration of Christian unity. The Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity has taken seriously the words of Pope John the 23rd, the things that unite us are greater than those that divide us. Now we've looked at the two cornerstone doctrines of Christianity and we have seen that there is a massive compromise but the com compromise is 100% in favor of Rome. There is no movement in terms of Rome's position, just by using clever semantics, they have maintained their position and Protestantism has relinquished its position. Now those were the two doctrines that required one lecture each, which we have completed. Now let's look at some of the other issues, which of course were also, well, enlightened by the Reformation. The year 2017 will see the first centennial commemoration of the Reformation to take place during the Ecumenical Age. It will also mark 50 years of Lutheran-Roman Catholic dialogue. Lutherans and Catholics have been able to reinterpret their theological traditions and practices. That's very one-sided. I think only one side has reinterpreted. The other one has merely rephrased. Recognizing the influence that they had on each other, therefore they longed to commemorate 2017 together. So we have to sign these documents of unification and we have to do it now. Now, I'm only doing a fraction of this document. If we had to deal with the whole document, we would spend weeks here. Pentecostal and other charismatic movements, they claim in this document, are widespread, and these powerful movements have put forward new emphasis that have made many of the old confessional con controversies seem obsolete. And you will remember what Tony Palmer said, if you have the same experience as I have, that's all we need. We don't need doctrinal issues. You recognize that I have the same experience as you, then God will sort out the doctrines upstairs 
and we can be in unity here. Well, that's a very easy way to brush all doctrine aside. Creating new commonalities and communities across confessional boundaries and will play a significant role in the observance of the Reformation in 2017. And we've just seen that last month all the evangelicals came together to sign the Joint Declaration on Justification and they will be partaking in this celebration as well. And then some interesting statements which I call Jesuit rhetoric. What happened in the past cannot be changed, but what is remembered of the past and how it is remembered can. Do you find that interesting? With the passage of time, indeed, it can change. Remembrance makes the past present. While the past itself is unalterable, the presence of the past in the present is alterable. In view of 2017, the point is not to tell a different history, but to tell that history differently. <laughs> it sounds like a modern school book. Everything is changed. History has been rewritten to suit the modern mindset. So this is the way in which they address these problems. So we have to be very careful when we read. Now, why was it even possible for Lutherans and Catholics to come together if the, the conflict was of such a vociferous nature. Well, the breakthrough, according to the document, for Catholic scholarship came with the thesis that Luther overcame within himself a Catholicism that was not fully Catholic. The crisis in Catholicism made Luther's religious protest quite convincing to some. It's very condescending. So Luther probably didn't understand Catholicism. He was a, a professor of Catholic theology, but he was misinformed. He didn't understand it fully, and he couldn't fully overcome his, you know, his conflict within himself. So the problem seems to have uh, been on Luther's side. Let's just think how, how Catholicism reasons before I go back to the document. So I just want to discuss what this Jesuit theologian has to say, Richard M. Gula, and he writes this book, Reason Informed by Faith, which I believe is a, is a misnomer. It shouldn't, no book should be titled that way because you cannot have reason informed by faith. It's an impossibility. You can have faith informed by reason, but this way around, is gobbledygook. He says, moral theology emerged as a discipline distinct from other theological disciplines after the Counter-Reformation Council of Trent. So when Protestantism and Catholicism divided, then moral theology became a talking point. What did the Protestants say? What's the basis of modern, of moral theology? The Bible. The Bible tells you what's right and wrong. Catholicism said no. <laughs> it's not the Bible. It's our tradition that tells you what's right and wrong. You can't use the Bible for that. So let's read it. The origin of Roman Catholic moral theology is a distinct discipline, and they go hand in hand with the Council of Trent's decrees regarding the sacrament of penance. Trent reasserted the norm of the Fourth Lateran Council requiring the confession of one's pastor of all moral sins according to number, kind, and circumstance. This required a deeper probing into moral problems with emphasis on forming a proper conscience, solving cases of conscience, and on making a precise determination of sins so as to make a proper confession. So Rome developed all kinds of categories of sin. This is a, a venial sin. It's a minor thing, you know, God will just overlook it. And then you had a mortal sin. This will take you directly to, to hell without passing go, etc., etc., if you do not repent and forgive. And everything had to be confessed to a confessor. 
He writes, since the Vatican II, a significantly broad consensus in moral theological literature suggests that the human person is the most appropriate point of departure for elaborating on the meaning of morality in general and for providing the fundamental criteria which are necessary for dealing with specific moral questions. Not God, not the Bible. That was the Protestant position. No, no, man must decide what is right and wrong. And it is the society at large which determines what is right and wrong. So if the majority thinks that one particular behavior is perfectly acceptable, well then you can legislate for that behavior. I leave that to your imagination to figure out what I'm saying. To say that the person adequately considered is the norm of morality does not dethrone God and raise the human person to the level of supreme value. Of course it does. If you become the standard of what is right and wrong, then God is no longer the standard, either the one or the other. You can't have it both ways. One is always bound to follow the judgment of properly informed conscience. The informing takes place in community. By appealing to various sources of moral wisdom, that could be Greek philosophy, that could be church philosophy, that could be anything. In the church, the magisterial, that's the hierarchy of the church, the Pope and his bishops, is the source of moral authority. So it's not what the Bible says, it's what the church says that determines what is right and wrong. Its teaching is very important, though not exclusive, factor in the formation of conscience and in one's moral judgment. To appeal to authority is part of responsible living. Remember that the Pope said? That you cannot leave religion up to the individual conscience. You can't do it. You have to appeal to the magisterium. In appealing to an authority, we believe what it will be, that it will be more correct, or we believe what it will be more correct about this question than we will, or than anyone else to whom we might appeal. So no matter what I think, the magisterium is going to be more correct than me. Fascinating. So God gave us all a brain in order to put it on a shelf and not to use it. Pope Francis extends Catholic priests' power to forgive abortion. Okay, so we have a society where this is a problem. Well, we'll, we'll deal with it. You can carry on, just come and ask for forgiveness and then you can do it again. And you come and ask for forgiveness and you can do it again. So he has the power to actually determine what can be done and what cannot be done. Back to our document. This is the joint document that they signed. Luther understood the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as a testamentum. The promise of someone who is about to die, as is evident from the Latin version of the word institution. Nevertheless, Together with Swingley and others, he emphasized his belief that Christ gives himself, his body and blood, that are really present. Faith does not make Christ present. All right. When it comes to the Mass, then Protestantism claimed that this was a memorial of a completed act. And this is in memory of what God had done for us in Christ. Catholicism doesn't see it like that. They see the Mass as a literal sacrifice equal to what happened on the cross. And that that bread literally becomes the body of Christ. And the substance of the bread is changed into the body, although you can't see it. And it is transubstantiation it becomes the literal body. Now Martin Luther was a Catholic priest and this was his theology. He was steeped in it. And even when he in discovered the many differences between the Bible and the teachings of the church, he clung to this doctrine for a long, long time where many other Protestants had given it up already and said, no, it's only a memorial. 
And Zwingli and others had disputes with Martin Luther, and he was adamant. Later on, he, he sort of moved halfway from the Catholic position to the Protestant one, and he invented a, a doctrine which was called consubstantiation, which means that it is the body and blood, but it doesn't stay it. It's just for a moment. So it's still the same thing. It's just a, a little step towards Protestantism. And then later, he conformed to the Protestant opinion in its entirety. But they don't inform you of that. So we have to check whether that is really so, because I don't want to create the impression that we're just grabbing this out of the air. Here they claim the real presence of Christ. The Fourth Lateran Council used the verb transubstantiare, which means that it's literally converted into the body of Christ which implies a distinction between the substance and accidents. Although this was for Luther a possible explanation of what happens in the Lord's Supper, he could not see how this philosophical explanation could be binding for all Christians. In any case, Luther himself strongly emphasized the real presence of Christ in the sacrament. Yes, he did. But they forget the historicity. He only did it in the beginning. He didn't do it in the end. So this is unfair reporting. Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogue on the Eucharist, Article 153, the question of the reality of the presence of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper is not a matter of controversy between Catholics and Lutherans. This should be shocking. The Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogue on the Eucharist was able to state, quote, the Lutheran tradition affirms the Catholic tradition that the consecrated elements do not simply remain bread and wine, but rather by the power of the creative word are given as the body and blood of Christ. Who's capitulated here? Rome or Protestantism? Interesting. In this sense, Lutherans could also occasionally speak, as does the Greek tradition, of a chain. Both Catholics and Lutherans have in common a rejection of a spatial or natural manner of presence and a rejection of an understanding of the sacrament as only a commemorative or figurative. In other words, it's not just a symbol. It's not just a reminder of what happened at the cross. It's literal. It happens now. Christ is sacrificed every time you say the Mass. This is not Protestantism. This is not biblical. This is complete and utter capitulation. Common understanding. Lutherans and Catholics can together affirm the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper. In the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, is present wholly and entirely in his body, blood, under the sign of bread and wine. You cannot spell it out more than that. This is 100% the Roman Catholic position. This common statement affirms all the essential elements of faith in the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ without adopting the consensual terminology of transubstantiation. How clever. So, my dear Protestants, transubstantiation, the word, is offensive to you? Let's just drop it. Let's not call it transubstantiation. Let's just talk about what it is. It's the real body and blood of Christ, the real sacrifice. Is that okay? And they say, yeah, that's fine. Does that make sense? This is such a serious issue. Now it goes further, and it gets worse. To the question of the real presence of Jesus Christ and its the theological understanding, is joined the question of the duration of the presence. Remember Martin Luther said, okay, I'm going to compromise a little bit, I'm going to move away from the Catholic position to the Protestant general view, and I'm going to say consubstantiation. He was there for a moment. So now they're debating, how long does this remain God? The question of the duration of this present, and with it the question of the adoration of Christ present in the sacrament. 
You see, if that is the body of Christ, the literal body of Christ, then you can adore it. You can pray before it. And you can worship it. And this is now a serious issue. This becomes a very serious issue. Also, after the celebration, so consubstantiation, yep, it's just a little while. And now, how long? <laughs> okay. Differences related to the duration of the Eucharistic presence appear also in the liturgical practice. Catholics and Lutheran Christians together confess that the Eucharistic presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is directed towards believing reception, that it nevertheless is not confined only to the moment of reception. Aha, so we move away from where Luther had compromised in the beginning, back entirely to the Roman Catholic position. However closely related to it this might be. This is scary. This is scary. This means you can venerate the host. With regard to the issue that was the greatest importance for the reformers, the Eucharistic, what's it say there? Sacrifice. The Catholic-Lutheran dialogue stated as a basic principle, Catholic and Lutheran Christians together recognize that in the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ is present as the crucified who died for our sins and who rose again for our justification as the once for all sacrifice for the sins of the world. This sacrifice can neither be continued nor repeated nor replaced nor contemplated, but rather it can and should become ever effective anew in the midst of the congregation. There are different interpretations amongst us regarding the nature and extent of this effectiveness. But by and large, Protestantism has completely capitulated. All right, let's have a look what Martin Luther had to say. Here is a uh, dictionary definition. Come now, let us reason together. What are transubstantiation and consubstantiation? Well, I've already explained it, so I'll just briefly go through it. The word transubstantiation, derived from the Latin trans, across, substantia, substance, the term is employed in Roman Catholic theology to denote the idea that during the ceremony of the Mass, the bread and wine are changed in substance into the flesh and blood of Christ, even though the elements appear to remain the same. The doctrine has no basis in Scripture, says this Protestant webpage. But the other document says it seems to have every basis in Scripture. Here's the book Table Talk. Now, Table Talk has a fascinating history. It is everything that Martin Luther wrote and that his colleagues and students wrote down furiously and kept for posterity. The book was banned by Rome, and if you had it, you were sentenced to death. And it was thought to be destroyed, but was discovered in uh, the foundations of a building wrapped in wax. Fascinating history. And the miracle of how it was translated and smuggled out and retranslated. It's absolutely amazing. And this is what happened. The book was eventually given to the House of Commons in England, and they were to decide whether this book was worthy of publication. And of course, it was a Protestant uh, conclave. And they had initially been at loggerheads with Luther because he had claimed consubstantiation and they were totally on the Protestant side, merely a symbol. So this is what happened. Whereupon they made report, dated the 10th of November 1646, that they found it to be an excellent divine work, worthy the light and publishing, especially in regard that Luther in the said discourses did revoke his opinion which he formerly held touching consubstantiation in the sacrament, whereupon the House of Commons on the 24th of February, 1646, did give order for the printing thereof, given under my hand on the third day of July, 1650. Aha! So Luther did not maintain his position of compromise. He totally moved to the Protestant view, so the document is actually misleading that they are bringing up. Let's see what Martin Luther had to say. 
Martin Luther writes, Even so, we must let the words of Christ remain and speak of the sacrament in suis terminus, in their terms, with such words as Christ used and spake, as do this must not be turned into offer this. So Martin Luther said, It is not a repetition of a sacrifice. It must not be so. What did he say about veneration, to which they agreed now? What signifies it to dispute and wrangle about the abominable idolatry of elevating the sacrament on high to show it to the people? This is what Martin Luther believed. That venerating the host was a what? An abominable idolatry which has no approbation of the fathers and was introduced only to confirm the errors touching the worship thereof, as though bread and wine lost their substance and retained only the form, smell, and taste. This the papists called transubstantiation and darkened the right use of the sacrament, whereas even in popedom at Milan, from Ambrose's time to the present, they never held or observed in the Mass either canon or elevation, or the Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord be with you. So Martin Luther was 100% on the Protestant side and held the Protestant position. And yet in the document, they referred to his early position. That is deception. Now, when you look at the Mass itself, every Roman Catholic church is actually not a church. It's a temple because there's an altar, and on an altar, there's a sacrifice. Here is a typical altar, and you can see there are steps leading up to it. You will remember that we discussed these verses, that all the altars of God were to be different to any others. There must be no steps going up. The Roman Catholic ones have steps going up. Thou shalt build the altar of whole stones. They may not be of hewn stones, let alone hewn marble. It was forbidden by God. And the lifting of the host and the veneration of the host, Martin Luther called an abominable idolatry. To defend this basic Eucharistic mystery, the Council of Trent made a series of definitions originally drafted as negative anathemas. They may be reduced to the following positive affirmations. This is now a Catholic webpage. The Mass is a true and proper sacrifice which is offered to God. That's today. That's not Middle Age theology. That's today. By the words, do this in commemoration of me, Christ made the apostles priests. And here's a very important distinction. Are we priests or are we ministers? And there's a difference. In the Old Testament times, they were priests. Why? Because a priest makes, brings an offering, a sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice. But if Christ is the atonement, as we discussed yesterday, then any atonement on my side or any act on my side to augment his action is idolatry. It's an abomination. The sacrifice of the Mass is not merely an offering of praise and thanksgiving or simply a memorial of the sacrifice on the cross. It is a propitiatory sacrifice which is offered for the living and the dead. This again is necromancy. This is forbidden in the Bible. For the remission of sins and punishment due to sins, as satisfaction for sin and other necessities, the sacrifice of the Mass in no way detracts from the sacrifice which Christ offered on the cross. Okay, so that sacrifice was nice, but you know what? Ours is just as good. You take part in ours, you're saved. Because by partaking in the sacrament, you receive merit. This is the burning of John Rogers. Now, Mr. John Rogers, minister of the gospel in London, 
was the first martyr in Queen Mary's reign, and he was burnt at Smithfield on February the 14th, 1554. I want you to look at the circumstances. His wife, with nine small children and one at her breast, imagine this, his wife, standing there while he's on the stake. The fire is not yet burning. Unbelievable. Nine small children, one at her breast, followed him to the stake with which sorrowful sight he was not in the least daunted, but with wonderful patience died courageously for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, who was John Rogers? Well, he's the man who finished translating the Bible because Tyndall was executed before he could finish the job. So John Rogers finished the work. He is responsible for all those chapters that William Tyndall didn't manage to complete. And as he was there on the stake, the sheriff came up to him and said to him, one thing you have to do, if you accept the doctrine of transubstantiation, if you will claim here before all these people that the bread literally turns into the body and of Jesus Christ, then you can come down and join your wife and your little children. And what did John Rogers say? No. And they burnt him. And today, if you should read that document, what do you think he would say? Just a question. Hebrews 10, 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for the sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. It just takes one verse to destroy the doctrine of transubstantiation. In actual fact, just for interest's sake, for those who don't know, this doctrine played a pivotal role in my own conversion. Because I was waiting for the priest in order to make a confession. And the priest was not available because he was shopping. Now that's very inconvenient because if I need to be forgiven and the priest is doing shopping, what if a bus runs over me in the interim period before he gets back? And uh, being a good Catholic, that bothered me. So I sat in the church and the host was present because the light was on. And I talked to the host, but the host didn't talk back because it is a corpus Christi. It's the body of Christ. It's the dead body of Christ. It's the sacrifice. And it dawned on me as I sat there and thought about this, that this is ridiculous. I have access at this moment to a dead Christ who I can venerate, but I do not have access to forgiveness because the priest is shopping. So what now? And I decided to return to my atheism. And uh, God had other ideas, but just for interest's sake, for those who might wonder about these things. Now, let's compare the King James Version and the NIV, for example, or any modern version, regarding this strange little word, Leturgos. Romans 15, 16, that I should be a minister, Leturgos, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Do you look at the modern translations? To be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, he gave me Oops. The priestly duty. Now, this was a point of controversy. Are we ministers or are we priests? Well, the word priest is used. I mean, Peter does talk about you are a royal priesthood. But that didn't mean that everybody was a sacrificial individual because that was never typologically the case. But when it comes to those that officiate, Paul refers to them as ministers. 
So now let's have a look at the document again. Within this framework, the council developed the notion of the priesthood of the baptized and addressed its relationship to the ministerial priesthood. In Catholic theology, the ordained minister is sacramentally empowered. Now you must understand Catholic thinking. A sacrament is a means to salvation. Taking part in the sacrament is a guarantee of salvation. So if you partake in the Mass, that is a salvational issue. Whereas in Protestantism, you can partake in the Mass and be just as lost afterwards as you were before, because it depends on what's going on in here, isn't it? And Martin Luther made that quite plain. He said, without the change of heart and the acceptance of, of God's truth in your heart, any of these enactments are useless. So you are sacramentally empowered. You have this power, this special power, to change the bread and wine into the literal substance of Christ. So Catholic theology is convinced that the office of bishop makes an indispensable contribution to the unity of the church. Catholics raise the question of how, without the episcopal office, church unity can be maintained in times of conflict. Luther's particular doctrine of the common priesthood did not adequately maintain the church's hierarchical structures. You have to have a special ordination, they say, in order to become an alta Christos, another Christ, another sacrificial uh, priest. Lutherans and Catholics also agree on the responsibility of ordained leadership for the administration of the sacraments. Lutherans say... The gospel bestows on those who preside over the churches the commission. Take note. Who says that? Let me read it again. Lutherans say, quote, The gospel bestows on those who preside over the church's commission to proclaim the gospel, forgive sins, and administer the sacrifice, the sacraments. Ah. Uh. Would you find that problematic? Would you find it problematic for a Protestant pastor to say your sins are forgiven? That's a Catholic prerogative, but it's not biblical. Who can forgive sins but God, says the Bible? So this is a serious, serious issue of compromise to the length where you cannot even understand that there can be something like this in this document. Administer the sacraments which they consider to be bound up with the Eucharist. So everything is bound up with this. Now where does this idea come from? That we are now to be priests and not ministers. Well, let's have a look at history. Ignatius of Antioch. In the first part of the second century, Ignatius, the bishop of Syrian Antioch, wrote several letters while being escorted under armed guard to Rome, where he was to be martyred. And in this letter, we encounter for the first time an ecclesiology which exalts one bishop over the rest of the presbytery. So this crept in into the early church. So all of a sudden, one bishop was the main man and the rest were subservient. And next comes Irenaeus, also in the second century, and he introduces this virtual infallibility. He also introduced the theology that you can venerate Mary. So these are not gospel uh, developments. These are developments which come after that time. So that was the next step. And then comes Tertullian. And he developed the doctrine of clarification. That is the distinction between clergy and laity. Where he says, you have the clergy over here and the laity down there. That's what the Pope says. It's not up to your individual conscience. He and his magisterium will decide what you may believe. Let's look at that up in the Bible. If you go to Acts chapter 15 verse 23... And I read from the King James Version, or any of the received text versions for that matter. And they wrote letters by them. This is the first council in Jerusalem. 
In this manner, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Okay, so who took part in the council? The apostles, the elders, and the brethren discussed the issue, took a, made a decision, and the letters were sent out to the other churches. This is what the apostles, the elders, and the brethren decided in council. So the whole church was involved. If you take a new translation, any one of them, this is the NIV, with them they sent the following letters, the apostles and elders, comma, your brothers, which it doesn't say at all, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. So now you have a hierarchy. This gives you the position to have a synod that decides on behalf of the people. So someone is elevated and someone is demoted. It's not biblical. It's not biblical. And then came Cyprian, and he elevated the clerics to priests. Cyprian claimed that the bishop is a sacrificing priest. The earlier doctrine of the priesthood of all believers began to be abandoned and slipped into the background, almost into oblivion. In Cyprian is found the germ of the division of the sacrament into two, the Eucharist, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, the mass, the new development, etc., etc., etc. So this is a development that came later. And in this document, Lutherans and Catholics agree that the Catholic position is the one to be maintained. We read further. The Second Vatican Council reaffirmed its understanding that bishops have by divine institution taken the place of the apostles. As pastors of the church, in such wise that whoever hears them hears Christ, and whoever rejects them rejects Christ and him who sent Christ. That was the Second Vatican Council, Catholic position. Nevertheless, it is Catholic doctrine that an individual bishop is not in apostolic succession by his being part of a historically verifiable and uninterrupted chain, etc., etc. There's only one. And that is the Pope, who is in direct succession. Finally, Catholics and Lutherans differ in both the offices and authority of minister, ministry and leadership beyond the regional level. For Catholics, the Roman Pontiff has full supreme and universal power over the Church. The College of Bishops also exercises supreme and full power over the universal Church, together with its head, the Roman Pontiff, and never without the head. So this is the Catholic position. The Pope is the boss. They say in a later one that Catholics and Protestants agree that the primacy of the Bishop of Rome is not a stumbling block to unity. That is phenomenal. Scripture and tradition. What was the Protestant position? Scripture alone, sola scriptura. Catholic position? No. Scripture interpreted in the light of tradition. Inseparable, separable division. Okay, Luther's understanding of Scripture, its interpretation and human traditions, the controversy that broke out in the connection with the spread of Luther's 95 Thesis on indulgences, very quickly raised the question of which authorities can call upon at a time of struggle. The papal court theologian, Sylvester, so-and-so, argued on his first answer to Luther's thesis, whoever does not hold to the teaching of the Roman Church and the Pope as an infallible rule of faith from which the Holy Scriptures are derived its power and authority, he is a heretic. And Yannick replied to Luther, the Scripture is not authentic without the authority of the Church. So when it comes to doctrinal issues, the church will decide. That's just giving a little bit of history. Now, when Vatican II speaks of church having ultimate judgment, it clearly eschews monopolistic claims. I doubt that, but nevertheless. 
Now this statement. Thus Lutherans and Catholics are able jointly to conclude, quote, Therefore regarding scripture and tradition, Lutherans and Catholics are in such an extensive agreement that their different emphasis do not of themselves require maintaining the present division of churches. In this era, area, there is unity in reconciled diversity. Uh, who's capitulating? Help me. Protestantism. Every single point we've discussed so far, it is Protestantism that capitulates. In the Lutheran Roman Catholic conversation, a clear consensus has emerged that the doctrine of justification and the doctrine of the church belong together. Now that's another inf incredible statement. How are you justified in Protestant tradition? By faith in Christ. It's an individual choice. How are you justified in Catholic tradition? Through your works? And it is administered by the Pope. So you cannot be saved without the church. And here they claim that the doctrine of justification and the doctrine of the church belong together. You cannot be saved outside this tradition. How can you affirm something like that? Since Catholics and Lutherans are bound to one another in the body of Christ, etc., etc., for this reason, when Lutheran Christians remember the events that led to the particular formation of their churches, they do not wish to do so without their Catholic fellow Christians. So we're going to commemorate this together. Because they believe they belong to the one body of Christ, Lutherans emphasize that their church did not originate with the Reformation or come into existence only 500 years ago. They acknowledge they're not a church. They were just a rebellion against the church. Is this where we're going? The reformers had no desire to found a new church. Correct. Martin Luther said, I want to reform the church. But when the, form, when the church would not reform, what did he say? You have to separate. They wanted to reform the church and they managed to do so within their field of influence, albeit with errors and missteps. So the Reformation was full of errors and missteps. So this prayer for unity, it is clear that the division of the body of Christ is opposed to the will of the Lord. Jesus also said, can two walk together lest they agree? At the fifth assembly, in 1970, the Lutheran World Federation declared in response to a deeply moving presentation by Jan Cardinal Willebrandt, we as Lutheran Christians and congregations are prepared to acknowledge that the judgment of the reformers upon the Roman Catholic Church and its theology was not entirely free of polemical distortions, which in part have been perpetuated to the present day. We are truly sorry for the offense and misunderstanding which those polemic elements have caused our Roman Catholic brethren. What is that? That is a complete capitulation. It's an apology for the Reformation. It's an apology. It's interesting that Rome responded with a statement, in as far as we have erred, we apologize. You know, that's rather fascinating. I always give them an example. If my wife and I should have had a serious argument, which of course we've never had in all our life. <laughs> but if it should so happen, and I was the guilty party, which also, also has never happened. <laughs> and I were to come to her after not speaking for three weeks and say to her, in as far as I have erred, I apologize. She would be so happy about that, wouldn't she? Just a question. Well, if we, if we sum it all up, it seems like a very sad day 
in the history of humanity. But besides being a sad day, I believe it has a deeper impact. And I think it will soon affect everyone on the planet. And I'll give you a little bit of, of background as to why I believe it. I believe history is about to be repeated. In Matthew 27, verse 24, we read, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And then you know the story. He released Barnabas. And they mocked Jesus and they plaited a crown of thorns and they put a mock road on him, put a scepter in his hand, not realizing that they were actually enacting a coronation in mockery, but nevertheless so. So they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they even put the sign up above him, because he was the king. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for in envy, but the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. Then Pilate answered and said again to them, What will ye then that I do unto him, whom you call the king of the Jews? And they said, Crucify him. And Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? And they cried out more exceedingly, Crucify him! And from there forth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And then Pilate tried to release him, and eventually he gave up, and he condemned him to death. And then he said again, But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. What an incredible statement. We have no king but Caesar. History is more fascinating than fiction. And the story of Caesar is absolutely phenomenal. So let's go to the history books and just unpack this. As the power of Rome expanded into many parts of Greece, Attalus III, the last king of Pergamos, died in the year 133 BC and left in his will all the dominions of Pergamos to the Roman people. Thus the kingdom of Pergamos was merged into the dominions of Rome. However, for some years there was no one who could openly lay claim to all the dignity and power inherent in the title of the kings of Pergamos, namely that of sovereign pontiff. The powers of the Roman pontiffs were therefore somewhat restricted. But this situation changed dramatically with the arrival of Julius Caesar. Let me just give you the history. When Medo-Persians attacked Babylon, the Babylonian priesthood escaped and they created this impenetrable city, Pergamos. And there they practiced the Roman, uh, the, the Babylonian religion. So there was the Babylonian high priest king God and he had the title Pontifex Maximus and he ruled with absolute authority and he was worshipped as God. Now, when the Medo-Persians took over, they never conquered Pergamos. It remained independent. The Greeks never conquered it. The Romans hadn't taken it either. And in 133, Attalus III bequeathed his title to Rome. And the Romans received the vestments, they had the, the dress of the priesthood, they became a king, as it were, but they were not so arrogant as to assume the title of God to be worshipped. And so this power 
was used and the titles were used, but they didn't use this power of the godhood until you get to Julius Caesar. And then things change. Julius Caesar was elected to the position of Pontifex Maximus in 63 BC. So that's two generations later. He subsequently assumed the position of supreme ruler of the Roman state. Thus he had vested in him all the powers and functions of the Babylonian pontiff, and he was the true legitimate successor of Belshazzar. Not satisfied with this, he was declared to be Jupiter's incarnation on the 25th of December, 48 BC, in the Temple of Jupiter in Alexandria. The Encyclopedia Britannica also says that Julius Caesar, there are signs that in the last six months of his life, he aspired not only to a monarchy in name, as well as in fact, but also to a divinity, which Romans should acknowledge, as well as Greeks, Orientals, and Barbarians. Following the pattern of the kings of Pergamos, the Roman emperors that followed Julius Caesar were commonly regarded as gods. And they built temples to these Caesars. And you had to worship the Caesar as a god. The Christians refused. They were thrown to the lions and they were the sport of the Romans. So here was a pontiff who had the title Pontifex Maximus, and he was a god. And the Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. What were they really saying? Revelation 2 verse 12 says, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things says he which has the sharp sword with the two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain amongst you, where Satan dwelleth. The Bible calls Pergamos the seat of Satan. The power and the title and the dominion of Pergamos went to the Caesar. Who has that title today? Who calls himself Pontifex Maximus? The Pope does. Does he aspire even to deity? Well, in the past, they put it on record that he does. But if you will look at this picture from 2014, Pope Francis leads the celebration at Vespers of the Solemnity of the Conversion of St. Paul, January 25, 2014. Here he sits on a great white throne between two cherubs, with four living creatures around him. What description is that? Isn't that the description of the great throne room in heaven? Where the God of heaven sits on the great white throne, enthroned between the cherubim, with the four living cherubs around him, or the four living creatures? Well, this is the hierarchy of the church. This is the body that determines morality. If this is not claiming the prerogative of God in type, then I don't know what this is. This is a blasphemy second to none. I also find it interesting that Obama used the backdrop of the temple of Pergamos when he accepted his uh, nomination. Now that's very strange because only one other person in history dared to do that before him and that was none other than Adolf Hitler who had his entire Nuremberg, Reichstag, whatever, building structure patterned after the temple of Pergamos. So the world is really in an interesting position and it's interesting to me that Obama also told everyone to heed Pope Francis and uh, Pope Francis was virtually inaugurated like a president is inaugurated. Because when a president is inaugurated, he goes first to the White House, he's received by the outgoing president, and then he addresses the houses between the two fasci, which the Pope did. Fascinating speech, no time for that. 
at the moment. And then he addresses the people by going out of the doors at the bottom, but the Pope went one higher. He went on the balcony on the top, which puts him above the president. I find that rather fascinating. I welcome His Holiness, Pope Francis encyclical, and deeply admire the Pope's decision to make the case. At the moment, this encyclical, which asks for various things on the environment, is rather uh, in the vogue with much discussion, especially with Donald Trump uh, not towing the line at the moment. So in it, it talks about the environment and that in the Eucharist fullness is achieved. Excuse me, what has the Eucharist got to do with the environment? This is rather interesting. Because even when it is celebrated on the humble altar of a country church, the Eucharist is always in some way celebrated on the altar of the world. It has to, part, to do with part of the environment. And Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God and with ourselves and with others and with the world. We have no king but Caesar. Isn't that interesting? When the Church of England separated from Rome, who took the title as head of the church? <clears throat> the king did. And then they tried to enforce it. And the Scots said, we have no king but Jesus when it comes to religion. We have no king but Jesus. And what happened? One war after the other. And there was such bloodshed and so much destruction and so much martyrdom that it rivals even the history of Catholicism. Isn't this fascinating how human nature is like? They want to sit on the throne of God irrespective of what stone they are, have their coronation on. We are called to include in our work a dimension of receptivity and gratuity, which is quite different from mere inactivity, etc., etc. Nevertheless, Pope Francis calls for a new ecological economic order. The Bible says, I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast. Now the Protestant reformers had always identified the beast as Roman Catholicism. If you pay it homage, the text says, then you are paying homage to the dragon. This is rather a serious uh, accusation. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that happened in 70 AD. And the temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed, and the people were scattered. You see, the gospel had gone to the Gentiles. It had been taken away, this privilege of being the exclusive herald, and it had been given to the Gentiles. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wing, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you, desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now when the Jews crucified Jesus and they said, we have no king but Caesar, the prophetic time of probation for the Jews didn't come to an end. That only happened three and a half years later when Stephen was stoned. When Stephen was stoned, that's when the gospel went to the Gentiles. That's when Paul was called, after the stoning of Stephen, when he was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. That's when Peter had a vision of an unclean sheet with unclean animals coming down, 
and three so-called unclean people knocking at his door, and he went with them, which was forbidden for a Jew, and he comes to Cornelius and he says, God has shown me in vision that I should not call any man unclean or impure. And then before that he said, you know that it is illegal for a Jew to associate with a Gentile, but God has shown me. So the gospel went to the Gentiles, and since that time, the heralds of the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ has been amongst the Gentiles. My question is this. When they said, we have no king but Jesus, and when they picked up the stones to stone the representatives who were preaching this gospel, God said, enough. The gospel goes to the Gentiles. What if the Gentile world has come to the same point in history? What if the Gentile world will say this year and in the times thereafter, we have no king but Caesar? And the doctrines that we held that elevated King Jesus to the position of sole savior with direct access to those that believe in him by faith, but again acknowledge the headship of the present Caesar, they will be following in the footsteps of the Jews. But then we have seen that Rome has said that fundamentalists who believe what the Bible says are dangerous people and that colonel said at Georgetown University, you have to eliminate them. And the legislation in the world is moving in that direction, where even the prime minister of England said that these people who have these views do not fall under the protection of human rights. Fascinating. Should they be eliminated because they stand in the way of unity? It's just a question. Are we heading for another destruction as Jerusalem was destroyed? The Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. I don't want to be an alarmist. I just want to look at the parallel structures and I'm asking the question, are we experiencing a time of trouble such as never was? When you look at the news, do you feel that the trouble is not just over there somewhere in Syria or wherever, but that it's actually at your door? And that when you're walking to the supermarket or walking in a square, it could happen at any moment that a vehicle could just mow you down deliberately? Don't you feel it's at your door? We are living in interesting times. Hebrews 11, by faith. Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. It's nice to be in party with the king, with the Pharaoh, but he chose not to. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not bearing the wrath, not fearing the wrath of the king, for endured as seeing him who is invisible. Not fearing the wrath of the king. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one that shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. I would like to stand like Moses. I would like to stand by the principles of the Bible. 
I would like to put my trust in the one who died for me. I would like to put my trust in the one who shed his blood for me so that he can be a propitiation for my sins. And I would be afraid to put my confidence in an earthly propitiator. May God give us wisdom as we study these things and think about these things. And this is not a fear-mongering issue. This is just information. And in the next one, we'll, we'll touch another nerve or two, but I suggest you all take a break, have a snack, clear the cobwebs, and see you in a moment. Thank you. Hi YouTube, I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.